Heaven's mercy see, beholding my despair, in pity burst the clouds between, and showed me that he is there. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. sing forever of Jesus' love divine, of all his care and tenderness for this pure love of mine. His love is in and over all the wind and waves obey. And then Jesus whispered, peace be still. to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Pastor. All right, I do apologize on Sunday nights. We have it playing uh, through, the, through the speaker here. So sometimes we get a little lost with one another. So we'll try and do better there. Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope you had a good afternoon, got a nap in, uh, possibly, and uh, just had a good time. Looking forward to worship tonight. Uh, Brother Brian, I don't know if it's you or it's me, but for some reason this area is just a little empty. Um, I'm going to blame him. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but we'll just blame Brother Brian. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Let's open with a word of prayer, and we will begin the service. Pastor Schottel, would you open us up tonight in prayer? Amen. You may be seated. And it's great to have uh, Pastor Nep Nepfield. I was close. I'm sure it was something like that. Uh, it's good to have you folks. Of course, the, the wedding's tomorrow, and we're excited for that. Um, would you stand and tell us how long you've been at your church and where exactly it's at? And just uh, uh, maybe tell us um, something about the church, um, maybe what God has done recently or what's going on. Would you stand and just do that for us? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So when you don't know a pastor, you know where you always go? You go to Twitter. So I went and looked up your family and saw some things that were going on out there. And praise the Lord. What a ministry. Thank you for being with us again tonight. And Pastor Schottel is here. Uh, they had their, he just decided to skip Sunday night tonight. He doesn't care. But no, they had a uh, service this afternoon. And uh, they're here um, from Elwood. And uh, would you stand up and tell us? Well, I just said where you're from, but uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on at the church. And uh, yes, that's his family in that row. Um, whenever we have a revival meeting, and I always ask, always ask the shuttles to come because our attendance goes up. So um, it looks better. Pastor Shuttle, would you share? That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes, thank you. And then right behind him, was it Pastor David? Pastor David, he pastors, I, I, we've not met up until tonight, he pastors in Eaton. Would you just share a little bit about yourself and the church up there, the name of it? Would you do that for us? Amen. Thank you. And then this is your son, um, and he introduced himself, and I forgot it already. I'm sorry. 
but thank you, thank you for being with us tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, wonderful. It's good to have. Now I'm very intimidated with all the pastors in here tonight. So I was studying extra hard this afternoon, trying to find all the big words I could find to impress the pastors here tonight. But we are glad you're all here. And uh, let's uh, let's begin. And uh, we're going to take our hymnals and go to him 627. 627, a song you should know. We'll all stand. And then after the first verse, we'll uh, shake hands and greet one another. We'll sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, 627. Brother Daniel, if you'd begin that for us. 627. one another. you're finding your places. Do what? <laughs> All right, if you'll find your places, we're going to sing that last verse of 627. Remain standing the last verse. Sing it from our heart. Oh, how I love Jesus. Daniel, restart that for us. 627, as you're finding your places. On the fourth verse, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first Wonderful. Thank you. You may be seated. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we have uh, quite a few things going on. I wanted to share this uh, tonight one more time. The Junior Church needs pennies donated for their offering they take up for our missionaries. Um, so if you'd like to help with that, just see Brian or Melissa. Um, they, they would take that um, and use that um, for, for missions um, in their contest. Once again, we took on two new missionaries this last Sunday. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, putting... Um, 
we're going to have to stagger our missionary boards outside in the hallway to make room, and that's exciting. I'm looking forward to that, and then also, uh, Lord willing, taking on uh, some more here soon. As uh, this this month, the giving has been great, and I don't know what today's will be, but I'm excited to see as God blesses you as a people when you give to worldwide evangelism. And uh, I am so excited. That just that just points to growth, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, uh, if anyone needs to be added to the directory, your name has not been added to it. Miss Connie is putting out um, another one here soon. So if you've not talked to her or your name was not in the old one, make sure you see her. Her and Houston are not feeling well tonight. So if you'd be in prayer for uh, the Dodds, uh, that's why they're not here this evening. This coming Thursday, we'll be working, um, uh, get, uh, having a dinner for our local Muncie mission. Uh, Miss Renee, she's right back there. She oversees that and uh, brings some desserts and then we'll need some people to be there to uh, serve and to have a smile and be an encouragement. Um, it's, 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 been a, it's been a really good ministry for the church, and I hope you'll be a part of that. We've had several opportunities to give the gospel with some of the men, and um, just a really good a really good thing, I think, for our church. So you take part in that. June 12th, uh, Brother Caleb Garraway will be here. We will have a potluck dinner following the morning service, and I want you all to take a part of that. And then Vacation Bible School. If you would like a t-shirt, um, make sure you sign up on the, the back. Um, and uh, if you're self-conscious like me and don't want to put your shirt size, you can just go up to Miss Rachel and tell her you don't want it on the paper for all to see. Feel free to go tell her that. Um, but we'll sign up for that. And there is a cost, and we'll need that money, and that will all go to Miss Rachel over here. Make sure she gets that. Um, and then July 2nd, we'll have our 4th of July picnic. Some of you have asked about fireworks. Um, we did have fireworks last year. We are technically city limits, but we're very, very much on the edge. Right across the street is outside the city limits. Uh, so if you would like to, let me paraphrase that. If you would like to ask me what you can bring, um, we can work that way. Um, I want to be a good testimony, and um, our neighbor will probably send off some pretty big ones. So I don't want to be in a competition um, at all. But um, we might be able to send off a few that night if you'd like to stay. We'll have a bonfire, and we'll have a really good time. So ushers, go ahead and come forward. I know that's going to be a... A good time for the church family. We had an enjoyable game night last Friday night. Several of you were here. It got extremely loud. And um, some of you played seriously and some of you goofed around. I don't know how many were involved. And in, I don't even know what it's, what's the game called with the phone? Who was running up? Miss Nikki? Heads up. Anyone in here ever played heads up? Okay. Horrible game with a bunch of people if you don't like loud noises. And um, <laughs> there were some things they were trying to act out and... Um, Never again. We're going we're gonna to make some rules in the church as to what happens at game night. And <laughs> Just kidding. I know that's a lot of fun. We had a good time. Uh, a lot of pizza, a lot of snacks, and uh, thank you for being a part of that. Brother Sean, would you ask God to bless the offering this evening? And as they take it up this evening, let's turn to page 233. 233, little as much when God is in it. Page 233. Jesus 
name. On that third, are you in the seat. All right, thank you. Uh, let's take our Bibles tonight. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one from the pew in front of you. If you don't have one at all, feel free to take that home with you. Um, thank you. All right, we're going to take our Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Acts. The book of Acts. We start at the beginning of the year. Um, going through two books of the Bible, one on Sunday evening and one on um, Wednesday evening, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Powerful, wonderful books, and um, we are, you men who pastor, sometimes it's always the balance to know how far to go and how much to give and how quickly to go through a book, but it's just so hard to get through the book of Acts. There's so many good things and so many good thoughts, and uh, I love this book. Acts chapter 18, if you would, this evening. Acts chapter 18. We're in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey. And this is a series I've entitled the Coffee Series, simply because my son dumped coffee on my Bible two weeks ago, and my page was opened to the uh, chapter 17 and 18, so um, we'll forever know this as the coffee series. All right, Acts chapter 18. Let's all stand if we can tonight. One more time. The Bible says this, starting in verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried yet a good while. And then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sencria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, that's Aquila and Priscilla, and he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, as was common practice for Paul. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return on t again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We need you tonight, God. I pray you'd bless your word tonight. God, I pray each one of us would leave here. Uh, feeling like you've spoken to us, God, and to serve you better this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Daniel, do we have that map up there tonight? Do we have that set? See if you can pull that up for me from last week. If not, um, we'll, we'll go through it another way. So in Acts, as we've gone through this book and we've seen the challenges of the early church, you remember uh, the church uh, got started, and man, it started off wonderfully. Uh, Peter goes out, he preaches, and he sees 2,000 people saved. Multiple more would get saved over a short period of time. The church would begin to expand, and God would bless it in wonderful ways. And God would use them, and they would grow, and eventually we see problems. Just like in any church, problems come. You remember the widows. Uh, the widows were, some were not being taken care of. So some came to the apostles, and the apostles said, pick you out seven people. And uh, they would take over the administrative duties in some areas, and they picked out seven. And we only know two of them, Stephen 
and Philip. We don't know who the other men were, but they were men who were filled with the Spirit. They were men who their peers looked at them and saw them as, as faithful people. And you remember we, we, thought, we thought through what would people say about you and I in the church? If God said, pick you out seven people, would, would they pick us? Are we people that, man, we love God, we serve God, we have it all together, we're serving Him. We talked about that. They came on the scene and we saw it was at that point God would take one of those seven known as Stephen. And you know the story, he would be stoned and killed, and of course he had a good attitude as it was all going on, and man, what a, what a hard time, but a great time, if you will, the church from there would spread. And you remember Philip goes just north of Jerusalem, goes up, and a revival is started. You remember he calls back to the, the apostles to come and uh, basically show that it, it is real and what happened there was real and to show camaraderie and uh, they came up there and Peter had, or excuse me, Philip had a revival going, things were going great. Do you remember what happened the next chapter? God said, Philip, I want you to leave. God, where am I going? Just go. I'll show you where. But I'm in the middle of a revival. People are getting saved. Great things are happening. God, why would you have me to leave here? I'll tell you in a little bit. Just follow me. You remember he would go and he would take the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. Someone was waiting that God had prepared. And from that, we believe that that's how the gospel eventually would get into Africa. Of course, we'll see later on different things regarding that. But we see the church would have struggle and would have problems and uh, the, the persecution would send them farther. And eventually we see uh, Peter would come on the scene again and we would have the, uh, the vision of Cornelius and God would tell Peter, Hey Peter, don't you call uh, uh, dirty and unclean what I've called clean. Take the gospel to the Gentiles. So Peter, and even though it was absurd for a Jew to ent enter a Gentile's house, you remember he went to Cornelius, went into his home. And of course he would come back and the church was a little taken back at the fact that he had gone to a Gentile and there were some problems in that regard, but the gospel was spreading to the Gentile world and the Gentile people. And aren't you glad for that? Because I'm a Gentile, I'm really glad for that. Then we see later on uh, things would happen with the church. Peter would eventually, the story about Peter would somewhat die down a little bit and then Paul would kind of take the central theme of the book. And that will take place for most of the rest of the chapter. But we pick up here in his second missionary journey. Daniel, do we have this up here? All right, we're going to see if we can make this work tonight. We're in his second journey. He has uh, been preaching. Him and Silas were in prison. We saw there were some problems with Paul and Barnabas. And uh, we see eventually Paul would take Silas. And we see in prison, the people would pray. They would get out of prison. God would bless them. They would go to Thessalonica. They wouldn't be assaulted, but one of the Christian men named Jason would be assaulted. Then we see they go to Berea, and then eventually they go to Athens. So we see the story here, starting in Antioch, where they were sent out. By the way, this is where we get the idea of sending out missionaries from the local church. These two men were picked out. This was the second journey. Of course, Paul and Barnabas would split. Paul would go up, and he would cover some of the churches he went to on the first journey. Tarsus was where he was born, so he was very familiar with that area. But then he would go into the area of Galatia, Iconium, Derby, Lystra. He'd be going around, starting churches, going to the synagogues, finding the Jews. But sometimes the Jews would not listen. And you remember we saw there's multiple Antiochs. There was one general in, uh, in, in one of the armies, and he called a lot of cities Antioch. So you'll see the term Antioch used several times throughout the book of Acts. And then he goes into what is known as the Roman Empire Asia. Not Asia as we would know today, but uh, he, he would go there. And you remember God would tell him, hey, I, I don't want you to stay here. I don't want you to stay in this area. So he'd go up to Troas, and he said, God, if you don't want me here, can I go north to Bithynia? God said, no, uh, somebody's waiting for you over there. And aren't you glad the gospel went over there into Europe? Eventually the gospel will come from Europe over. Amen. Man, that's exciting. Gen Acts chapter 18, we pick up, he's gone to Berea, and then he goes to Athens. And you remember we discussed in Athens, it was a dark, a dark city. And you remember, he walked through the city, he was all alone. I, I, I told you, I wouldn't be dogmatic on this, but I believe there was a point where the author of Acts, Luke, was with Paul and Timothy and Silas on their journey. I believe he was with them for a short period. Uh, I, I believe that by just some of the wording in the book of Acts, but whether he was or was not, Paul had two people, but he would leave them and he wouldn't bring them to Athens. 
So he's in this dark pagan city known as Athens, and he's walking through the streets, and man, the, the intellectualism and the knowledge uh, Athens used to be back in its heyday, the place of prime wisdom. Right? He's walking through here and everywhere you look, there's a temple to this God. There's a temple to this God. And there's a temple to this God. And Paul's heart is stirred within him. And Paul sees as he's walking through the city, he sees this temple with, the, with, a, with a, a sign in the front that says the temple to the unknown God. The people in Athens, they worshipped everything and everything. And they didn't want to miss any of the gods that were out there. So they had one temple specifically for the god that they have missed. And there's, uh, I told you this story, but there's, uh, uh, it's not, not in the Bible, but historically speaking, they say they would let um, animals, uh, sheep in particular, run through the city. And wherever the sheep would lay down uh, to, to take a break, they would lay down somewhere in the city. The closest temple they were, they were close to, they would take the sheep and they would sacrifice to that God. The ones that were not close to any of the temples, they would bring them to this temple known as the temple of the unknown God. And they would sacrifice to a God that they had never met. And you remember we talked about at the end of chapter 17, Paul goes up on Mars Hill. And Mars Hill is a place where anyone could come and discuss new gods or new traditions or new thoughts. Paul goes up there to Mars Hill with all these wise individuals and he stands in front of them. And we talked about the way he connected. You know, when we go soul winning, we're always looking for a way to connect with somebody, right? Maybe you're walking up to someone's door and you see, uh, you know, they've got a, a leash for a dog and you're hoping it's not a big pit bull or something coming out the door. But you, there's a connection there. So when they come to the door, you say, man, uh, you know, his little Fido home or if it's one of those little ankle biters, you're, you know, you're thinking, oh man, it's just a little tiny thing and you're making jokes. Is that your guard dog, right? You always find a way to connect. So Paul connects with these men and he said, I saw that you had this temple to the unknown God. And then he goes on to tell him, I know that one. <laughs> I know the God that you missed. I know who he is. But at the end of the story in chapter 17 and verse 32, you remember when Paul got around to talking about the resurrection? Look at verse 32 of chapter 17. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. So Paul parted from among them. So we said that it seems like there was a little disappointment as Paul was leaving the city of Athens. He goes to Corinth. This wicked city in the Roman Empire, if you were a very wicked woman or wicked man and you had a very wicked lifestyle in the Roman Empire, they would say you're from Corinth as a cliché. This city was horrible. Paul would go here and he would, uh, he would he'd start the church here and he, God would keep him here a while. And um, starting in verse 18, we saw in this chapter, we saw his profession was not his passion. So Paul came into Corinth, he met two people, and they were tent makers. And this was all to do with cloth and different things. It wasn't like a tent that we would necessarily say today. It was used for multiple things. He came in. He found two individuals. They shared the same interests. They took Paul in. They helped Paul. Paul helped them. It was a blessing. He comes in. But we said last week, Paul's profession was not his passion. You remember in verse 3, it talked about his craft and it talked about his tent making ability. But then in verse 4, what did he do? That wasn't the biggest thing to Paul. What was the biggest thing to Paul? He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. The biggest thing to Paul was not the profession, not the work outside of the gospel. It was the gospel message. That was what was big to Paul. Remember, we made that point last week. We also said and showed his protection and help. Down in verses 5 through 11, we'll not read all of these, but look at verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt. We see not only was his profession not his passion, his protection and his help was close. In every other city Paul goes to, he's getting kicked out. People are not listening. People are mocking. They're making fun. And so Paul may be a little discouraged. God comes to Paul and says, Paul, stay here. Nobody's going to put their hand on you. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. 
We see his protection and help. And lastly, we ended up with the thought last week, his problems did not stop. Say, Pastor, I know we have the promises of God. Listen, friend, your problems will not stop. Right? Man, sometimes we get this false idea that somehow, man, we're, we're God's children, so this shouldn't happen to me. Uh, I don't see that in Scripture. As a matter of fact, I see quite the opposite. I see that those who are in Christ, they will suffer persecution. Right? As we go through this, I want to preach on this thought. It's not about me. I found this story this afternoon. There was a man who had worked hard all of his life and saved much money. But he was a real miser. Just before he died, he asked his wife to put all his money in the casket with him when he was buried. Being the good wife that she was, she promised to do so. After his funeral was over, just before the casket was sealed, his wife put a white envelope in the casket and turned away. A close friend who had been present when the husband made this selfish request asked the wife if she thought she should reconsider her actions. The wife responded, I cannot break my word, so I wrote him a check. <laughs> that man thought it was all about him and he wanted that money to go with him. It's not about me. As we begin in verse 18. That wasn't bad, right? Our church people who mock me all the time. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. You guys are too much. So Paul tarries here yet a good while. I want you to see tonight, point one, God fulfilled and fulfills his promises. God fulfilled and fulfills his promises. So his friendship was so great with these two individuals, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, till eventually they'll follow him. And maybe with the idea to follow him all the way back to Jerusalem, I don't know exactly if that was the case, but eventually his next stop is going to be in Ephesus. We'll see that here in just a minute. So they follow him and eventually they'll stay in Ephesus. But their friendship was so great, Paul stays in Corinth for a good while. Exactly how long? I don't know. But he stays here. God fulfilled his promise back in verse 10. He promised no man will hurt you. We're not going to kick you out of this city like you've done other places. And I don't know. Can I... I don't know how Paul was feeling at this point, right? It seems like Paul, city after city, when he left Athens, the response was not the response he wanted. As a matter of fact, when he brought up the resurrection of Christ, they mocked him. And they made fun saying, hey, we'll hear about this later. We're not interested right now. And it almost seemed like Paul, he's gone through all these cities and he's been to Philippi and been kicked out and been to Thessalonica and been kicked out, went to Berea and then was kicked and had people from Thessalonica Thessalonica come the 60 miles down to Berea and then he was kicked out. I don't know about Paul, but I know human nature. Man, defeat, 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 defeat. And then you hear God say, nobody's going to touch you. I almost wonder for this time if maybe it was just Paul saying, I can breathe. No one's going to kick me out. I'm not going to go to prison. I'm not going to get beat here. I, I can just serve for a little bit. And I wonder if this was a little bit of God saying, hey, Paul, remember, I'm in control. I'll take care of it. So he's here, and he's there for this period of time. And he stays there. God kept his word. But notice the, 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 the end of this, this verse here. And then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. They had a business. They could take it anywhere. Having shorn his head in Sencrea, for he had a vow. Now, the Bible is not clear exactly on what this vow is. Uh, from what I understand, and some of you may know, know more, but from what I understand, maybe this is the vow from Numbers chapter 6. And maybe he took this vow for different reasons. But at this point, he came to this city. He had grown out his hair. And he came to this city and he would cut it. And what you were supposed to do is take the hair back to Jerusalem, to the temple. That was the Old Testament culture. So I don't know exactly what kind of vow he had made. But for some reason, he had to get back to Jerusalem. He made this vow. So notice not only does God fulfill, and God fulfills his promise. Take your Bible quickly. We're going to go to several scriptures tonight. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Say, Pastor, I need something to hold on to tonight. I feel like I've been beat down, and I feel like I've tried to serve God, and I've been in God's will, but I just feel like I've been beat down. Maybe you need to do what Paul did. Paul heard God say something, 
and he trusted him. So we a lot of scriptures we could go to, but let me just take you to, to, to some here. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 in the Sermon on the Mount. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Hey, just picture the flowers out there in the field. They've done nothing. <laughs> they have no spirit, they have no soul, they've done nothing. I'm the one who keeps them coming up. I'm the one who takes care of that. Friend, we can get a hold of promises in Scripture. Be careful, don't take them out of context. Too many people take way too many promises in the Bible that aren't promises in the Bible for you, by the way. Um, there's some like that. But a promise we can grab a hold of and that we can take with us. That's what Paul does. God fulfilled and fulfills his promises. Man, Daniel didn't see everything that would come after Daniel chapter 9. Daniel didn't get to see it in its fruition. He would pass away. And by the way, there's some things coming down the pike that were prophesied. They will happen. By the way, that's what we're out telling the world. Hey, God is true. God is real. Everything he's ever said has come to pass or is coming to pass. This is why we have urgency as Christians. Because we recognize that the end for our world is coming. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth, the, 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 the new Jerusalem will come down. And man, we're pointing people to Christ and we have this diligence about it. But Paul recognized God fulfills and fulfilled his promise. Now he talks about this vow that he had taken back in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. So he leaves here. Comes back and he sails across the sea here. And he comes to a place called Ephesus. This is Asia, if you will. This is the Roman Empire Asia at that time. God gave him his desires. Go back to Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Acts chapter 16. This is before, this is during the Macedonia vision, the, to, 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 to the call. Acts chapter 16. Please don't miss this. Not only does God fulfill his promise, but Acts chapter 16, look at verse 6. Now when they had gone through, out through Phrygia, the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in where? So they were forbidden, so God said don't, but Paul had a desire to do so. In, the, in, the, in this area, there was a, a saying. You ever heard this saying, all roads lead to Rome? There's a saying in the, this area of Asia here, all roads lead to Ephesus. It was a major city, so if Paul would have stayed in Asia, there's no doubt that he eventually would have gotten down to Ephesus. God finally brought him back to a place that he wanted to go. Notice this, God fulfilled and fulfills his promises, but God gave him the desire of his heart, just not in his timing. It oft, it's often said that the person who delights in the Lord values the giver more highly than his gifts. Take your Bible, go to Psalms 37. Psalms 37 tonight. I want to give you something to hold on to and to grab onto in a, in a harsh world. Psalms 37. Look down at verse 4. Psalms 37, excuse me, let's read verse 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Notice verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now I understand that Paul is not going to stay in Ephesus very long. But Paul had every desire to stay in Asia, and God said, don't stay here. And Paul in chapter 16 would say, God, can I go to Bithynia? And God would say, no, don't go to Bithynia. There's someone waiting over there. And you remember, he got to Philippi, and there weren't even enough Jewish men to have a synagogue. There were some women who were down by the river who were worshiping. Paul went down to, and they would get saved. God said, I have someone waiting for you. He got to Thessalonica. Can I be honest with you? There were very few men in the Bible who were qualified or as wise as Paul to deal with the men in Athens. I don't think Peter, listen, I, I honestly don't believe Peter. I know the Holy Spirit couldn't help him, but Peter was a fisherman. 
He was not a trained individual as far as with scripture and with history and with books. Paul was trained. Paul was very intellectual. God had a plan and I believe part of God's plan was to take Paul into these areas that maybe others would not have known how to handle. Brought him down to Athens to Corinth. But notice God says God gave him his desires. The idea here is delight. It implies pleasure and enjoyment. Let me read this paragraph. In context with the surrounding verses in chapter 37 of Psalms, verse 3 and 5, this refers to those whose desires are in harmony with those of God. Someone quoted this verse to me recently, and uh, they've been praying for a long time for something to happen. And they said, Pastor, that verse said, if I delight in him, God's going to give me what I want. And I said, no, that's not what that verse said. And that person is very, very upset with God right now. The, the idea here is not, man, if I love God, a God's just going to do whatever I feel is right. A person who delights in the Lord, listen, has righteous desires. He will not desire anything that springs from selfish desires. No one can expect God to give something contrary to his will. No one. Say, why? God, don't you answer this prayer that I've given you. I've delighted in you, God. You said you're supposed to answer. Well, maybe it's contrary to his will and his pleasure. And you know what a good definition for sin is? Anything that is contrary to God's will or pleasure. So by asking this and by pushing God into a corner saying, you have to do this, could it be that we're sinning? Take your Bible, go to Psalms 21. Psalms 21. I don't want to get too far off track, but Psalms 21, just a few verses tonight. David sees God in a mighty way. Look at verse 2. Thou hast given him his heart's desire and hast not withholden the request of his lips. Selah. David was a man who wanted God's will to be done. Go to the book of John. Let's look at the ultimate. The ultimate person to look to. The ultimate example. John chapter 14. Y'all still with me tonight? All right, John chapter 14. Jesus, last night, before the crucifixion, he tells his disciples, yes, the first few verses are very well known, but look at verse 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Take your Bible, go to John chapter 17, lastly. John chapter 17. God gave him his ultimate desires Eventually he would go here, he'd go back to his home church, we'll read in just a minute, but eventually he'll come back to Ephesus. Notice John chapter 17, and look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus, this is known as the great high priestly prayer, and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he would give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What would bring God glory? The death of his son. Say, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't work. This would ultimately bring God glory. And Jesus is our ultimate example, one that we should follow. God, I don't want to do this if this is not going to bring you glory and honor. And Paul, he said, I want to stay in Asia. No. Hey, I want to go to Bithynia. No. I've got something for you over there. Get to Macedonia. Get, get into Europe. Get into these areas. But eventually God gave him the desire of his heart. Go back to Acts. Acts chapter 18. So as he goes, God does give him the desire of his heart. There are times where God may not say no, but he will say, wait. But Christian, I don't know about you, but that's not fun. I want the answer now. God, I need a yes. God, I, I need this bill paid. God, uh, God, I know I put myself in this predicament, but God, uh, you said if I delight in you, you'll pay this bill, so God, pay this bill. 
Well, the uh, bill's not paid. Well, God, you must not be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You must not be on the throne because it was just a measly bill and you couldn't even pay it. God, I had a health issue. You didn't fix it. You must not be the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. You must not be real God. What a shame. And yet, have we ever been there? Maybe we don't say those words, but sometimes we think, you could have done this, God, and you didn't. Why? Paul understood that God had a bigger plan for him. Notice down back in Acts chapter 18, we need to hasten through these verses tonight. So he comes to Ephesus in verse 19. God has brought him back to where he wanted to be originally. In verse 20, when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast. That's why I believe it had something to do with the vow he had taken to get back to Jerusalem for the feast. That cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you. Notice these three words. If God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. I think Paul got to Corinth a little beat up a little bit. Can I just... I don't want to add to Scripture at all. But it just seems like Paul leaves Athens, and it just seems like those people didn't listen. He comes to Corinth, and this is a wicked city. And God says, Paul, don't worry about it. You just stay here. And now Paul is about to leave after this time of seeing God uh, fulfill his word and keep his promises. And I think Paul leaves the city abounding in the joy of knowing he's in the center of God's will. Because he turns back and he says, look, I'll come back here if it's God's will. I'll be back if God is okay with it. He leaves in an awful big hurry. But he'll leave, uh, 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 he'll leave a couple people behind here. Quilla and Priscilla, he'll leave them back in Ephesus. He's abounding, he's enjoying, he's serving God, and he's going back to Jerusalem for some reason. I, I don't know exactly the reason. Some of you are much wiser than I, I'm sure, and could have an answer for that. I don't know the exact vow or what all that meant, but he had to get back to Jerusalem. But God had fulfilled his will, and God had given him desires. And at the end of verse 22, he completes his second missionary journey. But I want to notice lastly today, lastly tonight, verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, where's there? Well, eventually, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say in this verse, it said in previous verses he would go back for the Feast of Jerusalem. So it implies that he comes back to Jerusalem, which is on the, the southern end of Israel. And then eventually he'll go up into Antioch, his sending church. And when he gets there, he stays there for a short while. And then he leaves. What does he do? What does he do? And after he had spent some time, he departs all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. I want you to see a godly man's relentless pursuit of his calling. A godly man's relentless pursuit of his calling. What has God called you to do? We've all been called with certain things. We've all been called to tell people about the gospel. Some of you have been called uh, different areas. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. If God's called you here, serve here to the best of your abilities. If God's called a missionary to go to another country, man, serve there to the best of their abilities. Wherever God has placed you, whatever God had for you to do, listen closely. Did God call Paul to stay in Antioch? Everybody's asleep now. No! He was sent out from the church. God had a plan for him. God had a purpose for him. So Paul goes back. We don't know how long. Stays there for a little while. But what was Paul's real desire and purpose? To do what God had called him to do. So where does he go? He goes back to the churches in, in the region here of Galatia. And he goes and he starts strengthening the churches. Because Paul's desire was, listen to this, spiritual growth of the believers. That was Paul's burning desire, that they would grow, spiritually speaking. And my friend, as Christians, I, I hope our desire is to, number one, grow ourselves. Uh, our, our Sunday school class on Sunday mornings back here, the title of our class, the theme of our class is we're committed to grow as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He went back to the churches that were already founded on previous missionary works, probably Tars uh, Tarsus, uh, Derby, Lystra, Iconium. He went back to these churches. He wanted to see them grow. 
And I can just imagine as Paul came back and he saw some of them and no doubt they were glad to see him and he probably asked them, hey, are you growing? Are you reading? Are you studying? Are you learning? Are you, are you, do you have a new passion for the Lord? He goes back because he knew how fickle people could be. You remember the book of Galatians? You remember what he writes? He says, hey, uh, be careful who your teachers are. And I think chapters 1 and 2. Be careful of who, what the truth is. Make sure you have the truth. Hey, be careful of uh, the, 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 the method you're using in chapters 5 and 6. Make sure you have a good conversation with the Lord. Make sure you're his children. He writes back because he knows how fickle people can be. These infant churches... He understands these churches need grounding in the scripture. So lastly, this evening, we see the relentless pursuit of a God-called and God-equipped man. But notice in verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So Paul is in Galatia. Back in Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla are still there. There's a man from Alexandria. He comes to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in the spirit. The idea of fervent, I think this is interesting, is the idea of boiling. Boiling up inside. Fervent in spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. But this was the flaw. Knowing only the baptism of John. I don't exactly know where this man learned and was trained. I, I definitely wasn't near Jerusalem because he would have heard Peter's sermon, the Pentecost. On Pentecost, he would have heard those things, so it wasn't there. But here was a man who had, had somehow heard of John's baptism, the Bible tells us, and he, had, he understood what was taking place, and who he understood that John would baptize the Messiah. He didn't know who he was. He didn't understand. So what happens when he comes to Ephesus? There's two people that Paul leaves behind, that Paul's helped and Paul's loved on. And what do they do? Look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. I know you're all tired and I know it's warm, so pay, pay close attention. He comes to the synagogue, he's up there teaching, he's talking about the baptism of John. Aquila and Priscilla are there, they hear him teach. And what do they do? They go up to him and they say, look, man, you're missing something. No. They say, hey, come to our home. They don't embarrass him publicly. They don't attack his character. They don't yell at him. They don't bring shame upon him. They say, hey, come to our home. Let's talk about this. Hey, we know something. we got to add to your le lesson here. We know something that's a big deal, a major flaw that you're missing here. Right? Whenever somebody's teaching and they're not teaching that Jesus is the Messiah, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's a little flaw there. They say, come here. They had a lot of things right. He would have known much of the Old Testament. He would have understood Isaiah chapter 53, talking about him coming. He would have understood all that. But he didn't know that, hey, we, we know this guy. We know what happened with this man. They bring him back. But notice he was not too lofty in his thinking. He said, okay, I'm willing to be teachable. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to listen. Verse 27, 28. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come and helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So he goes back to Achaia, which is Corinth, is where he would end up. And Paul would write the letter. I think it's chapter 3, and he would mention this man, Apollos. Apollos would be trained. Apollos would go back, and he would do great things for the Lord there in Corinth. He was teachable, willing to learn. So the church there, Quill and Priscilla, would send him on his way with a letter of recommendation to serve in Corinth. So the question tonight, to give or to get... Selfish service is impressed with the big deal. True service finds it impossible to distinguish the small from the large service. Selfish service requires external rewards. True service rests contented in hiddenness. Selfish service is highly concerned about results. True service is free of the need to calculate results. Selfish service picks and chooses who to serve. True service is indiscriminate in its ministry. Selfish service is affected by moods and whims. True service ministers simply and purely. 
We find the idea of Aquila and Priscilla we see here. We find the idea of Paul we see here. And then we see this final man. And we see these men were not out, and these, this lady, this husband and wife, and these two men, we see they're not out to get something. They're out to give of what they know and who they know. Oh, friend, to give or to get, to have. What a great man Paul was. And Paul would eventually go on. We're going to see in chapter 19, the baptism of John's disciples is going to be talked about here next week, Lord willing. But I pray that our attitude would be this. I'm not in this for me. I'm in this for him. Maybe I'll be the teacher and I'll help that young man uh, get over to Corinth. Maybe, maybe, I'll be, maybe I'll be the Paul, or maybe I'll be Aquila and Priscilla, and I'll just be doing what God has called me to do and just stay where God has called me to stay. Whatever it may be, are you in it to get something, or are you in it to give uh, all of you? Not about you and me. It's not about who gets the accolades. It needs to be all about Him. We need to be so careful. Heavenly Father, God, I love you. Lord, I thank you for the attention of your people tonight, God. God, what a powerful passage of Scripture. God, we love the fact that you brought Paul all the way around, and eventually he would get back to Jerusalem. Lord, he wanted to stay in this area, and God, you said no, but you did bring him back. Lord, I pray, God, that we would see the difference when you say wait and when you say no. God, I pray we would be patient, and God, we would endure, and God, we would recognize we're not in this to get, but to give of ourselves for you. And one day you'll reward us in a great mighty way. And we look forward to that day at the judgment seat. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being with us tonight. We appreciate it. 6.30 uh, Wednesday night we'll be in the book of Luke and continue our series there. God bless you. Have a great week and uh, good luck on the marriage. Is they, they're not even here tonight. Are they two are getting married? Well, tell them we said good luck and uh, praying for them tonight. So God bless you. Have a great evening. You are dismissed.